So I'm delighted to introduce Saskia Sassen, who is uh, the Robert S. Lind Professor of Sociology and member of the Committee on Global Thought at Columbia University. And um, you know, the trite phrase that she doesn't need uh, any introduction is probably more true in her case. But I'm going to introduce her anyway. Uh, she has author authored widely influential works, and some of them, and I'm not going to count all of them, but some of the more influential ones are The Global City and uh, A Soci Sociology of Globalization, Territory, Authority, Rights, From Medieval to Global Assemblages, my personal favorite, and more recently, Expulsions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy. And as you can see from these titles, the, the canvas her, of her work is really large. And you might say, well, she studies globalization. I mean, what can be larger than that? You know, a global economy, global finance, and global migration. But in her case, um, she also provides a very comprehensive framework for the analysis of the global. And um, in some ways, her, her work on the global city is, uh, is, the, is the initial foray into transforming kind of received notions about what you know, urban formations are. Um, and the global city, she brings to attention the idea that there are global processes and practices and institutions that do not reside just you know, in The Hague and, you know, but there is a new kind of global that crystallizes within the city in very small uh, neighborhoods. So in that sense, she transforms urban studies because before that, the cities were studied in their interiority, in their you know, broad hinterland, in their you know, local arrangements, and local crime statistics. Uh, but here she uh, brings to bear this massive analytical framework. And then one might ask, what is the global? What is the national? Well, then she writes territory authority rights. These relatively three trans historical components, territory, authority, and rights. Their different arrangements start giving us different social formations from feudalism to kind of national, you know, the thickness of nationalist institutions. And from within that, the, the rise of global institutional uh, arrangement that's emerging today. So as you see, her analysis, her canvas is really large and analytical framework is massive, but but you would also find in her work that you know, separates her from macro theorists in some ways. That ultimately she makes these frameworks speak to the cleaning lady, to the janitor, to an undocumented immigrant. And that's where I think the power of her analysis uh, takes us. So with that, I ask you to join me in welcoming Saskia Sassen. Thank you. Well, it's a, I don't know how the, oh, here's the mic, right. It's a great pleasure to be here and to have a chance to talk to you. Um, I know this is a very mixed audience, which I love, you know, many different subjects. So um, I do try to be clear, but it doesn't always work out that way. Uh, thank you for that very nice introduction to the work. Um, I wonder whether we could have the lights a bit lower. I thought the, we were going to do that. So I, I want to talk, <clears throat> thank you, about something that, uh, yeah, that is my first slide, by the way. Huh? I like blank slide. Uh, the rise of extractive logics. Now, we all know about extractive logics, mining. Once you've taken out the stuff, you don't care anymore. That's it. My type of extractive logics include a whole variety of conditions that we do not usually associate with extractive logics. Um, one of these is high finance. Another one is student debt. High finance now can make the most out of the massive student debt we have. The student debt is a negative. That doesn't matter. They, they, and and the, the core element that I also will be touching on is algorithmic mathematics. Algorithmic mathematics means, in one very simple way of putting it, we see the building, but what the building, say a big luxury building, but what is actually happening is not the building. The building has been transformed by algorithmic mathematics 
In other words, physicists, and I don't have it against a physicist. This is high finance I'm talking about. Huh? Uh, by algorithmic mathematics, you have transformed it into a mass of materialities. And the high investment circuit wants asset-backed securities. Derivatives, they're for us. Derivatives have existed for a long time. This is a in financial instrument, right? That chances are a lot of you who are buying whatever under retirement rules or whatever, you're getting derivatives. Not a good idea. Regularly, a whole bunch, you'll hear 14 municipal governments in Italy all went broke at the same time. Why? Because what they thought was debt was actually a derivative. So these are some of, some of the elements that I want to touch on. Um, and, and I want to, my, my aim is to communicate, not to impress with weird words, OK? So I'm just hoping that it uh, will be clear. I'm trying to find, here we go. So one way of framing what I'm trying to do is to ask, what is the steam engine of our epoch? In other words, the steam engine didn't change everything, but it changed enough to mark a difference. Not, it didn't change you know, a lot of things, but it became a very significant, it's the beginning, right? Uh, so one way of thinking about it is, what is that which can make a new ordering? Again, not transform everything. In our complex uh, societies, we don't change everything. And so often then, foundational transformations are not so easy to detect because it all looks more or less the same. And so some of the stuff on high finance that I want to talk about uh, has to do with precisely that. And let me just mention one item which sort of unexpectedly brings together two worlds. I'm involved in a project uh, uh, which is sort of aims at showing and explaining why, the why of certain things. Financial firms, there is one particular financial firm we are tracking, have bought in many different countries, this one particular firm has bought in many particular in many different types of countries, big housing complexes for low-income people. And so you stand back and you know you might say, why? Why are they doing that? And there are two reasons that they're doing it. One is that they buy, they, they throw out all the residents, they fix it up, and you know they double the, the rent, so to say. That is the simplest version. The other version, and it comes back to my initial image there, is that the high investment circuit wants asset-backed securities. You will hear me say this, this line several times, and you will, I hope, never forget it, because it's important, actually, that we, the average citizen, knows it. So how do you produce an asset-backed security? You need something actually material that will help. It can also be other sort of more, more complex formations, but materialities. So a building, I repeat, is a lot of materialities. As building, it doesn't help. But through a whole set of very complex steps, which can be up to 15 steps, you transform it into a field of assets. We don't see that. We only see this. So we are already, we, the average citizen, the average resident of a city, is already at a disadvantage. Because there is something that we see the building, we see the building, we see the building. But something very different is actually happening. And so now we have hundreds of buildings in the United States, thousands of buildings if we bring in Europe and some African countries where this is happening and some Asian countries. So this is sort of one, one way of thinking about it, one, one focus. And one way of thinking about it is sort of what I'm trying to put in, in this slide, right? And the last sentence, what is in and what is out? So we, our pension funds, which some pension firms now are in hands of financial firms, you know, that have really violated the rules of the game. But we are sort of out. We don't know that, we don't see that, we don't feel that. But the average citizen is actually being pushed out of comprehension of some of the stuff that's happening. 
So this is a very unhappy story that I want to talk about. Now, let me start with this particular graph, which I, I let's see. Oh, you don't hear me. Do you hear me if I stand yeah. here? Is it important to have the recording or not? Why don't you give us the mic? Yeah. Okay. There is a mic? Ah, there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So look at this graph, right? And you see this, let's see, do I? Oh, yeah. So it starts with less than a trillion in 201. And then six, seven years later, it's 62 trillion. Now, in, I invite you to think of anything that you can think of which has this growth rate. Now, furthermore, those 62 trillion are just 10% at that point. This is right before the crisis, uh, the famous crisis. They're just 10% of the actual value of all financial assets that are out there circulating, which is 600 trillion. <coughs> Global GDP of all the countries in the world at that time is a fraction of that value. All the currencies issued by all the countries in the world is about 250 trillion, not 600 trillion. So you have to stand back and to say, does this measure that we call trillions actually help us understand what is happening? Not really. And so this is sort of what I, I've been working on this for quite a few years to try to understand what is actually behind all the language that is used and deployed. What is happening? What are the <coughs> realities at ground level? Oh, let's see. Uh, so this is another element that I want to put on the map. And again, some of this stuff may be sufficiently unfamiliar to you that you feel a bit uncomfortable. Don't worry about that. You know, you really don't need to know this. You just need to know the final outcomes of all of this bad stuff. But here are some of the instrumentalities. <laughs> now, look at that title, Number of Dark Pools. Dark Pools. When Bernanke, you know, our very distinguished economist from Princeton University, who was the head of the, you know, the central bank, etc. When he ended his term, he said all the good things and this and that. Blah. Then he said, and we're also dealing with, that was his language. When you really think about it, you say, wow, dark pools in finance. What is that? And then he said, most of the trading in financial instruments is happening in privately owned networks, huge networks owned by mostly what we still call banking firms, they're really high finance firms. And we do not know what is happening inside of them. In other words, what happens in the stock market, which is the public moment, that's where you and I are welcome. That's just a fraction of a reality that the financial system is able to build. Now, when you, when you look at these, here you have the US and Europe. The US, of course, always bigger than the others. Huh? So I don't know if you can see this. But anyhow, here are, anyhow, th so these different years, et cetera. And, and again, um, this is just, you know, this is just an image. Because he said himself, Bernanke, we don't really have all the precise information, which is in itself quite a dramatic statement to make. <clears throat> now, I want to now jump on to something that looks like it belongs to a completely different world, which you all have heard about, which is the so-called mortgage, mortgage crisis, the subprime mortgage uh, that, that was meant for low-income people to be able to buy <coughs> a house. Beautiful idea, really. So what happened there, actually? As you know, it then went into crises, and most of those people lost whatever they had put in. 14.5 uh, million contracts were signed, we should really say extracted from, low-income families, by far the most, 
who did not own already a house. They were told, sign. You don't have to give us anything. Sign. To produce 14.5 million contracts in a period of seven to 10 years actually entails a massive deployment of people. You understand, it, it really does. And, and one item that I want to bring in sort of on a more philosophical level, it was really invisible to us. That is a massive deployment of people, a massive number of signatures. We didn't see it. Now, I'm Dutch. The total population of my country is 16 million. <laughs> and if something would happen there, I guess I, one would notice it, you know, certainly on those, on those figures. Um, in the meantime, I'm hoping that you read this stuff and that I can sort of move on. Um, so here are some other figures. Now, these figures repeat themselves, you know, a bit, so it's not a very strict, but it is one of the sources that we have, so I just mention it. And we're really talking millions. Now, 17 or 14.5 million, that's the, the, the ones that really suffered. There a total of over 16 million contracts were actually signed. But um, 16 million contracts, that, that really, that takes a lot of time to sign. That is very hard work. That is, I repeat, as I already said, a massive deployment of people. Sign, sign, sign. And I bet you, most of you, never noticed this. I don't know, I'm curious, did anybody notice that this was happening? In, in, a, in a tiny country like the, the Netherlands, I can imagine that we would have noticed it because it would have meant the whole population of the country. But here we don't see it, which is another thing that the materiality of space sort of re-emerges as, you know, as, a, as a conditionality, if you want. Anyhow, there are the numbers and they repeat themselves, as I said. Here is another way of looking at it, the high point, and then it goes down. Uh, this instrument also entered Europe. And there, you know, some of the countries that were most affected, this actually goes on, but it, it somehow it isn't here. Um, but there you have, you know, several of these countries where these are the numbers, etc. So the, the Europeans, they also, we saw a lot of losses there. Again, basically an invisible story. Uh, the, part of the story came out in Spain, but that's about the only one where we saw that. Now, one outcome of all of this winds up being empty land. Empty land not because there's nothing built on it, but empty land because what is built on it is empty. Now, then you have to stand back and ask, well, what did these financiers think they were doing? How was this going to help them in any way? And I sort of want a minute of a pause for you to think of what would be the possibilities, right? So I'm not going to answer it right now, I'll get there later. So one outcome, empty urban land. Now I want to focus on a second mutation of urban land. And this is the buying up of property. So I'm looking at the top 100 cities across the world, which are, if you want, the object of desire of investors. And these are, in this case, this part, because there's also a second development, but this development is mostly very fancy properties. Now, just to clarify the meaning of this, um, so this is when it really has taken off, 2013 to 2014, it really has taken off. It starts already, you know, a few years before that. Now, what, what this means, basically, that one year that you see there, say, New York, I can't quite see the red thingy. Do you see? There it is, okay. So this New York metro, you know, is it? 55, whatever. This is just for one year, and it means acquisitions of existing buildings. That is what we're talking about. Uh, the 10.9% looks low, but that is partly because before that, that number, this number was even higher. You understand what we're talking about, right? And newcomers are also appearing. So New York and London, these are the, the, the key cities, but again, I, the list is really a hundred. So there's a, quite, a, quite a mix of cities from across the world. Uh, here, 
is just top cities for total national and foreign property investment 2014. So this is yet another categorization, but here actually it's the same as the prior one, but it sort of shows you a longer trend, right? So there is whatever that is, San Diego is in there, Toronto, you know, and but you can see that the major cities, though that keeps changing, you know, as, as time goes by. And here you have total foreign investment in property. In other words, these are just foreigners buying up property. So you have London, the queen of the domain here. Here you have the numbers. The growth here simply represents growth over the past year. You can see that, <coughs> that Shenzhen, newcomer, very high. You know, these are rotating histories because they don't, buy, they don't keep buying. They buy X number and then they move on to the next city. And here you have, oopsie. Sorry about that. Here you have Amsterdam, enters the picture, and Shenzhen, China, as I already mentioned. And again, this is just the growth rate. If there is a negative, it's just vis-a-vis -vis the prior year, right? Uh, and here you have sort of a long range. You can see severe concentration at the top. But at the same time, when you look at the full 100, you know that quite a few cities are in play in this sort of thing. And so one, one, uh, one question that one might ask is, what does this all look like? You know, I mean, what, is, what, what are the visuals on this? And so I must say that, uh, so I, um, I was asked by, um, by a journalist who had heard me talk about this or seen some pieces. And he said, let's go walk in London. This was in London, hey, that's the Tims. Uh, let's go walk around some of those properties that you are talking about. And I frankly never go there. I live in, I live, I live in New York, in, in, in London basically, most of the time though. I am a full-time prof at Columbia University, so don't tell anybody. But anyhow, so there is the river, and that's chock full of tourists, this area. So, you know, I, 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 I don't know why, but you know, I just don't go there. But this journalist was very insistent. He was German for, for the site, very serious. So I said, okay, let's do it. And so I'm walking, we're walking around there, and, uh, and I hear the tourists say stuff like, oh, look at all these beautiful British buildings, blah, blah, yeah, you can imagine. And I happen to know some of these buildings. For instance, this is just one example. <laughs> so all these buildings here that you see, which are mostly very beautiful, sort of older buildings. I don't find this one particularly beautiful, but anyhow, they're all owned by one Chinese company. Now, what I want to emphasize here is not the fact that it's the Chinese company. What I want to emphasize is what we don't see. We can't see that. Uh, other datum sort of just en passant, uh, the Qatari royals now own more land in, in the central area of London than, uh, than the Queen of England, which I almost think it's sort of cute, you know? She, she owns enough, so. But you know, what, what, what really strikes me is that our eyes and the materialities in play are less able to tell us what they're about than I think was the case in the past. Now, maybe I'm wrong with that, but that is sort of a strong sense that I have, you know? How we lose capacity to actually see and understand certain dynamics compared to an earlier period when it was all a bit simpler and we didn't have very fancy instruments, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, this is a very particular case in New York. Um, uh, I don't know if this is worth talking about, but, but uh, anyhow, one, this is a huge set of towers that a Chinese, one Chinese company built and um, and one of the nice things uh, at the beginning was that they, with, uh, there was something about the title that uh, they, they came up with. So they, they, they didn't like Atlantic Yards. Now, if you are a New Yorker, you know that the part that is problematic is yards, right? Because that's like low level, low cost. But for them, it was not that. For them, it was the Atlantic part. Because they, of course, they own the Pacific, right? So, so they literally called it 
Pacific Yards, which didn't last very long because so many jokes were made, you know, in the newspapers, etc. These are sort of when you begin to look at the innards, you know, of these sort of events, you find all kinds of sort of they're really sort of cute, you know, and and uh, so I just you know now. The top 100 cities that I described to you by property investment account for 10% of the world's population, 30% of the world's GDP, 76% of property investment. Now that language in the last one, property investment, I have trouble with. That's not my language. That comes from you know, the, whatever the, 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 the entities that are putting this out. Um, it's not property investment. It's property acquisition. You know, there's something else. But this notion, because investment gives you a sense of we're going to make it better or, you know, something. But no, no, no. So we should, we, we don't even have a proper language to capture what we in other settings refer to, for instance, as land grabs, you know, which is clear language. You grab land, you know, from small farmers, from whatever. And here, so I really, object to this language. I just want to mention that sort of en passant. Um, now, another, another element that is part of this history is literally the inventing of new housing markets. And so here is one. There are quite a few of these inventions. And some of them are quite interesting. So this is one of them. So this is, uh, and, and actually the list goes on. So this is the following concept. This is a market international, though it doesn't mean international, it never means all countries. Huh? This is just a bunch of rich countries that are part of this market. And there is a minimum price for buying. And the price is pretty high, that minimum price. In other words, you're already excluding all kinds of. Um, and so, you know, on some level, just to, to, to clarify perhaps, uh, when, when hospitals hire new, uh, new doctors, etc., they very often have particular other hospitals or universities they want to deal with. And that's a bit this model here, too. There are preferences, there are, you know, there are exclusions. And so you might say, well, so what? You know, really, so what? The minimum prices of these properties, and this goes back, this, by the way, was done by the Financial Times. I helped, but they did this. And this is, goes back a few years. But those are the minimum prices. Those minimum prices are by now much higher than that. And you can see the main nationalities, right? So you have uh, Monaco, the Russians, this is the Central European, you know, UK, Italians, Scandinavian, Swiss, Paris. Russian, the Russians buying a lot. Uh, CIS again, Middle Eastern, Italian, French, Benelux, Germany, UK. London, Russians, French, South African, Italian, Indian, Greek, Australian, uh, Dubai, African, Kenya. Quite different, this configuration. New York, French, Italian, Spanish, mainland Chinese, Singaporean, Brazilian, Argentine, Canadian. Shanghai, Hong Kong, Taiwanese, US, Canadian, Korean, Singapore. You know, and it goes on, by the way, the list goes on. But it's not a huge list because it's a very select, closed market. And I can assure you that you and I are not in that market. You know, these are, and you have quite a few of these. These very privatized, special, highly specialized markets that, that and we tend to think of the market as some sort of open formation, right? Something that, well, there are, they are inventing quite a few markets that don't fit that that mode. Now, why does all of this matter? And here's sort of one quick language that one can use is because, and for me this is very important by the way, that the city is one of the spaces where the poor, the disadvantaged, can actually stand up and say, as we used to say in Argentina, uh, you know, this is my city too, right? And that is Historically speaking, also, I think one of the important values of cities, that the city needs, no matter what, it needs an extraordinary variety of people, of specialties, and that means an extraordinary variety of levels of income. And, um, 
And the city is really a, a working city. It doesn't have to be a perfect city or a beautiful city, but sort of a working city. Is one of the spaces where those without power actually can have voice. Now, Manhattan right now is which is just part of New York City, is a space where those without power barely have voice. When Manhattan is just completely a transformed space. It's very alarming and very unattractive. But again, basically in most cities, they need the low income workers <coughs> because those workers execute all kinds of... So the tissue of the city is really sort of a very a tissue marked by enormous variability huh? of conditions, of imaginations, of nationalities, etc. In my reading, just to add something, um, if I ask myself, where is the frontier today? The, the only frontier we really have today is inside our big cities. Now, your city strikes me as extraordinarily neat. Everything works, is that so or not? That's the visual. I just drove through it, so you know I don't know very much. Uh, but certainly, a city like New York <laughs> does not strike you that way. You know, it's a bit different. Uh, so, so um, when we think as the city as a space where those without power can get to make a history, can make a stand, can make reclamations, etc., this is clearly. It sounds beautiful. It varies in terms of its viability, right, for the those without. But, but still, there is something, and, and as I was saying, for me, the frontier space, which one could define as a space where actors who come from different worlds have an encounter for which there are no established rules of engagement. This, all elements in there matter to me. Uh, that is enormously valuable, enormously important. And, and that means that there is a, well, in my, the, the new project that I'm doing now is about ethics of the city. I'm not sure my English fails me, if it should, you could maybe advise. Is it ethics of the city or ethics in the city? You know, you have an opinion already? <laughs> no, because I, my, again, uh, I don't know which one works better, but maybe we can enter into that in the discussion. But so I'm trying to argue that uh, most of our beautiful treatises on ethics stop short of entering the space of the city. Clearly, because the question of ethics in the city becomes very messy. I mean, you know, we have so much. Every city has inequalities. There is no way around that. Every city has abuses of power. There seems to be no way, I mean, we can reduce them, but we're not going to eliminate it. So the city is really a very complex zone. Now, I grew up in Latin America, and in Latin America, in Buenos Aires, a huge city. And there, the poor would regularly say, estamos presentes, you know, we are present. This is also our city. You know, that was like a, like, almost like a, a routine for them to reassure themselves. This is also my city, you know, that, that kind of a thing. Uh, in a city like New York, it, it works differently, I must say. It, it's quite a, quite a different story. But, but, but again, this notion that, that the city, almost by definition, has such an enormous variety of levels of income, etc., and that the city needs that variety, it needs that mix to function, is for me an invitation to develop a new ethics, a notion of ethics that captures the city. And the wonderful president of my university decided, yes. And so they are funding me uh, uh, for a project that I want to go to the poorest areas in Beijing, to you know, a whole variety of different places. And of course, of course, New York and Chicago, it's such a cities that I know quite well. Because I think there is something that we haven't quite addressed when it comes to the question of ethics. And I think that we will gain clarity if we recognize the existence of an ethics that contains within it inequality and injustice. Because that might then invite us to a more complex notion of the ethical 
than just, you know, what we have now. It's, it's really, it's beautiful what we have now, but it leaves out uh, a few things. Um, now, other element about this urban space, you know, the capacity of the city to make us into urban subjects. Whether you are the cleaning woman or you are the, the big uh, whatever investment, but we become urban subjects. This is a momentary and partial moment in our lives in a city. It's not something that is there, you know, all the time, but it's there every day, right? That there is a moment when we are all urban subjects. The subway in New York City is a good example of that. I mean, some of the super rich are not going to be there, clearly. But it's an extraordinary mix of people who never hang out together. But in the subway, you know, we are sort of shoulder to shoulder. And that's just one moment. But different cities have different uh, traditions, clearly. So when we're all urban subjects, right? When the city can hack, hack in the good sense, you know, in other words, unsettle the original design. That is how the notion of hacking started, right? Now, years ago. But anyhow, I, know, I like this notion that the city can hack, unsettle all the other more specific subjects we also are. You know, and when you begin to look, and there, there is a slightly longer list of items, I just don't want to go through them, but when you begin to think of the city as having that capability, that you are shoulder to shoulder sometimes with, you know, people with whom you never hang out, etc. But also the notion that the city needs this variability, huh? this, this mix of people. Now, I want to bring two more elements into the picture now, which are a bit, a bit different. So one of them is the question whether we are actually witnessing in bits and pieces, in very partial instantiations, a new systemics, a logic that is actually a logic of extraction that is installing itself in very partial ways. And that is something new, something different. It wasn't always that way. And when I talked about the grabbing and the buying of land, etc., of urban buildings, of buildings in cities, that is already one element, just to, to, to clarify. Um, I'm going to skip this. First, I want to invite you to look at this graph. Some of you may know it. So it, this is just a footnote to settle something that I said earlier. So corporate profits after tax in the US, 1940s to 2010s, et cetera, in billions. In other words, sort of uh, a certain type of period. We have the crisis there, right? Now, oopsie. So here, So that crisis that a lot of workers in, in, in New York and in the United States really lost their jobs, et cetera, for corporate profits after tax, if you use that as a measure for corporations, it lasted, what shall we say, three minutes? And then they went higher up again than before. In the meantime, we have the figures, about 70% of workers who lost their jobs or had reductions in their incomes, et cetera, you know, we're still suffering. Now, the other one is, and this is even more impressive, right? Here, here's a wrinkle. When they lose somewhere there, it, it lasts like two minutes, so to speak. It lasts a bit more. And then the corporate profits went up. Now, the crisis that we experienced, some of you may not be aware of that, it's still with us. A lot of workers, a lot of types of firms, a lot of entities have lost a lot of ground, and they have not recovered. Second point, a lot of the new jobs that were created since the crisis, I'm talking about the 2008 crisis, right, uh, were jobs that were far lower paid, et cetera. So, you know, there was a real, a lot, a good part of, of, of the people in, in this country actually suffered. Many of us, like in the academy, we may not have noticed it. But, and then you have these, this is for all corporations, right? You have these corporate charts. It, 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 like nothing, like nothing happened. And now it's even more acute, I would say. Not cute, huh? acute. 
Now, here is something, I don't know that this is worth, I can't even see it. All right, no, well, we'll skip that, that. We all know about that. Um, we can skip. Uh, now, oh, how many of you, now I'm going to have two questions about two graphs, so this is one of them. How many people know this graph? Nobody. You know it. <laughs> okay. This is a very interesting graph, and uh, let me sort of clarify it for you. So income share of top 10% earners, right? So, and what it shows you, and look at the years, what it shows you, the up there, you know, very high concentration of wealth. Then it comes, you go in that middle, those middle years, you know, when it was after World War II, we had several decades where there was, the, there was a real transformation in the distribution of benefits, benefits in terms of income, jobs, et cetera, et cetera. You really, you know, we are, we are expanding, we are growing, there is a really positive, and it really goes down, and, the, and that lower part means that there was a far fairer distribution. <laughs> then comes, you know, the, the, even before the crisis, clearly, it just then goes sharp up again. In other words, we had a period, and many people still think or write or argue that we're still in that period, the middle part. Huh? The middle part represents, I repeat, that much more income was distributed rather than being concentrated at the top. Huh? And, and we had that period, but we also got out of that period. And for me, the, and this doesn't depend on individuals deciding. These are systems in play. So for me, one very quick way of putting that is that what happens in really 1980s marks the difference, the 1980s. It was an invisible story at that point. It only becomes visible much later. But what happens is we open up to sort of a kind of a new type of internationalism in terms of business, banking, you know, all the, all the major sectors. And um, so we deregulate, we privatize, and we globalize. Globalize in a very particular way. This is not the internationalism of older times. And the 1980s sort of marks the achievement of that transformation. And that transformation had as an outcome, visually speaking, we might say, a return to trends that we had seen in an earlier period that mar were marked by great concentration at the top, and we're back there. Now, I don't know how many of you look at the statistics on all of this, but the, the data are pretty formidable in showing enormous concentration of wealth. And we're not talking 1%. People are always saying the 1%. Forget about the 1%. They've always been there. What it is is the 30%. In a city like New York, it's probably almost 40%. If you have 40%, High income workers, not the super rich again. But that means that in a, in a building where before you had three families, now you have one person who has made it into a luxury, I don't know what. You know, and these are the things that a lot of people are not seeing or not understanding because the, the, also the stories that are told are not quite capturing this incredible transformation. Now, I want to come back to this period, 1980s, because it's often not quite uh, understood, I think, what happens there. So the United States has always had big firms operating globally. This is not new. The United States has used land, bought land in all kinds of other countries. That's not new either. There is something else that is new and, and that I sort of want to emphasize here, and that is the changing of laws, the changing of uh, concepts of what's a good investment, et cetera, et cetera, a whole set of rather practical issues that are not necessarily going to be described in your average textbook. That's also an issue for me, right? That there are these makings of new histories that sort of get lost. They, they are there, but we don't necessarily write about them or or teach our students about them, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so what you have then, and, and here is sort of, I just want to give you some images. So you have the big corporations, which had been dominant, say, if I think of a city like New York or Chicago, right? The big corporations, as some of you may remember, or they sort of, many of them leave the city. 
cities are still poor at that point. The major cities of, in the United States are poor. And, uh, but these big firms at the same time are going global. How are they going global? They're not glo going global by they themselves going. They want connections and, and, and sort of uh, locating parts of their operations you know, in 10 countries, in 20 countries, in 70 countries. Once one of these big corporates is operating in that many countries, guess what? They can't do it all in-house. So the global city function that I have sort of developed and, and sort of detected, it's not simply about the global. It's the fact that when the major corporations, and this is not just happening, by the way, in the United States, it's happening in other countries as well, but let's just stick with the United States. So when they decide to go global, they need, act, and that means operating in 25 different countries, in 75 different countries, in 120 different countries, whatever. But it sort of is something that takes off. They need expertise, and certainly in that earlier period. What are the uh, investment preferences of Mongolians, of Argentinians, of the French, you, you name it. They need investment information, they need what are the legal issues, different laws in different countries. They need an enormous amount of very specific information. The global city function is not simply the global city. The global city function is, and, and the image that I want to, to give you is, it's a sort of like a huge operation made up of many, 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 many small, highly specialized firms that installs itself in London, in Paris, in New York, in Chicago, etc., etc. And that's a networked system. So at a time in New York City, when the commentary in the newspapers and the experts were saying, New York City is finished, cities are finished, the big corporates are moving out, all the, all the insurance, the big banks, they were all moving out of Chicago, of New York, and of other major cities. So that is, the, that, that is sort of what the experts say. And we have digitalization, because digitalization emerges at that moment. And who needs a city? At that same moment, the city becomes a strategic site, but they don't see it. I remember now, I, I was an illegal immigrant. I arrived as an illegal immigrant to New York. I just put all my cards on the table. And I, my first job was as a cleaning woman. But in that story lies the fact that I got to know the cleaners on Wall Street. And so, I had my nose close to the ground, and I knew these guys were, they said, it's fantastic what's happening. We just have so, many, so much work to do. I can keep bringing in my cousins from Republican, the, the, La Republica Dominicana. Blah. And I say, but you know, when I read what the experts are saying, New York is finished, cities are finished, nobody needs cities. And, and see, I don't know why they say that. And so I say, can, can I have lunch with you sometime? Lunch is at midnight. Now, Wall Street at that point, was not a 24-hour operation. There were computers humming, you know, 24 hours. But there was not really people who were tracking stuff. So I tell one of my buddies, they were all Dominicans, I say, can I have lunch with you? I say, yeah, yeah, come. So I go at midnight with my sandwich. Very important, you know, that you played by the rules of the game. And the rule of the game was, you, ha you take your own sandwich. So at midnight, I go there. It's such a sort of tricky, you know, because it's a very desolate area in a way at night at that time. And so we sit down for lunch. And at some point, I ask them, but for whom are you cleaning? Since everybody's saying that all the firms are leaving, and you know the big insurance companies did leave, and the big, they all left. And this guy, the capo, says, come, I'll show you. And we were in one of these huge, you know, these buildings on Wall Street, sort of, this is now goes many years back, right? But, and so he shows me, by the way, and they have access to everything, you understand? Everything. And, but they, they are very serious, and they play it by the rules of the game. And so he shows me a lot of boutique, fancy, super fancy, but sort of smallish, including Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs started 
installed itself in one of these huge buildings. I mean, now they are, you know, they have their own big building. And so I began to understand. And he said, which I could never establish, by the way, confirm. He says, and in all these buildings that we're cleaning, it's not that many here on Wall Street, uh, we, have, um, we have 70 nationalities. The cleaners <laughs> of Manhattan put me on the track that allowed me to understand a whole new system. And one fancier way of putting it, a bit more abstract, a systematicity, you know that way of speaking, was installing itself in the city. And so I understood, oh my god, this is what globalization means. It doesn't mean that they all leave. It means that they can leave, the big corporates can go wherever they want, but what they need is this new intermediate sector that can give them what they need, 25 hours of Mongolian accounting, 18 hours of whatever, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that sector is highly networked. They need each other. So they become a deeply urban condition. What marks New York City even today, what marks Paris today, Paris is a bit different because they have their own separate center there, uh, but also in London, in Chicago is this new intermediate sector. That is where a lot of the money is being made. These are not the super rich, huh? but these are very high, highly specialized. They travel a lot because they need to pick up on the latest developments, that law changed in that country, et cetera, et cetera. That is the global city function. It is not the big corporate, you know, the traditional corporations, because they really sort of moved out. But what they needed was access to that highly specialized sector. Now, I want to just, here are some of these others, uh, but I'm just going to skip. So I want to now uh, talk about something else. There are two more elements that I would like to cover. So one of them is sort of the notion of in the shadows of urbanization. And here, you know, the, the whole question of land, the whole question of uh, uh, people losing their housing, etc. And so I'm just going to skip that, and etc. Uh, more land grabbing, because much land is being killed. So there is a whole alternative history to what I've been talking about, which is happening in a whole variety of countries across the world. Expulsions, expulsions, expulsions. Grabbing, grabbing, grabbing. 150 corporations buying up land all over, but we're talking mostly in global south countries. And, um, and about 30 governments, the Saudis, the Americans, the Germans, the Dutch, buying big land for mining, for water grabbing, you know, the, what we never think of is that the Coca-Colas and all that, and I, huh? they, they, they're major grabbers. They buy land and they don't leave it till they have extracted the last water and then they leave and they buy another patch of land. So they're killing land. So, so land is getting grabbed and killed in many different ways. Um, here we have, see, I'm not going to, I just want to get to this notion of a geography we must imagine. Uh, this is a, a, a slightly complicated, but some of you might understand what we're doing there. And, and um, I just want to leave it on there for those who might be interested. But uh, then I'm going to move on and end with a couple of things. And the question here is, here is, who are we, the citizens, in this context, right? Now, the context is a bit intermediated, huh? So, uh, who are we, the citizens? How many of you know this map? This is a typical answer. Nobody. No, not even you saw this map ever? I can't believe it, that's serious, that is a serious datum. Um, so, well, you can see government and private surveillance agencies. This map is in the public domain. This was something that the Washington Post did years ago. We ne never have managed to get a replication, but they keep building these buildings. So all those dots, it's a mix of government-owned buildings, and they also, of course, contract private firms. Now. They are gathering data about everything, about all of us, all the time. Potentially, there is an irony in there. They have so much data. They, when, when they really need to find something, it's hell. You understand? 
So it's sort of it's sort of uh, interesting, but it's also a bit alarming, you know, to think that the grandma who's sitting in a cafe there in downtown <laughs> Chicago or whatever, uh, she's also in that system. Everybody's in that system, and we know for a fact also that basically when they're trying to find a criminal, they first go to their conventional elements and then might try to find, to track somebody in this amazing data mountain. So I don't know where this goes, but it is impressive. Now, here are some of the, the other elements, you know, together, okay, about 17 million square feet, et cetera, et cetera. We can skip that. Um, now, I want to, here are the key agencies. You are all familiar with that. The black budget, as they call it, huh? Uh, spending mostly goes towards you. You can read that very quickly. You know, you're combating terrorism. And the, but this is older data because we cannot now replicate this data. Huh? So it's, it's only, probably everything has gotten bigger. Uh, that would be my guess. Uh, who's dangerous? This struck me. Now this we got. You understand how we got this, right, or not? This, it is not that, they, that the government sent it to us. Okay, But it's in the public domain now. So uh, now... Who's dangerous? Department of Homeland Security issued warnings against veterans, uh, environmentalists, Nation of Islam, FBI, and probably... Now, I want to show you now, and this is thanks to mm -hmm, uh, what we know the NSA can do. The Dutch in me you can tell that I'm smiling, right? I find it all a bit, a bit ridiculous rather than scary. But anyhow, here we go. So you look at some of these things, what they can do. Like they can track the communication within media organizations like Al Jazeera. Okay, you know, Al Jazeera tends to publish most of its stuff, right? Um, it can hack into the UN video conferencing system. And it goes on and on and on <laughs> with what are mostly sort of, you know, I don't know, maybe the Dutch in me, you know, we Dutch tend to take all of this stuff that is connected to power like a bit of, well, that can go only so far. Maybe I'm wrong, but I somehow cannot take this very seriously and maybe I have a problem. Huh? So many, some, one of you might alert me. But it is, at the same time, what strikes me is the nonsense side of it. You know, this is a very powerful system. But what are they getting out of it? You know, they are tracking conversations in the United Nations. I mean, wh what is that? So that is sort of my position on it. Now, and Europe, of course, has now also, you know, joined this kind of, for the longest time, Europe did not, but it has. Um, I wanted to leave you with one of these. Uh, thank you very much. That's it. I'll just leave you with that open-ended note. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, uh, my question is about specifically the case of white return in the US context. So how does, I mean, I think we, we have some sense, but in what ways is the the subprime mortgage crisis, how is race and specifically anti-blackness in the US context playing into this problem? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see, I, I'll just speak from here. Um, well, we, the data is, is quite clear. We have, you know, we have detailed data that, uh, in, in relative terms, uh, there was a disproportionate uh, disadvantage in all of this, or losses, if you want, among black, uh, especially Latinos also, but less than blacks. And we have, there is a lot of data on this. In other words, we're talking households who were sold this prime, uh, this so-called so mortgage, um, who signed off and then wind up losing everything. So. All groups lost, but the strongest losses were among black households. And second was Latinos. And the whites, much less so. Huh? So, because partly they were aiming at people who didn't own a house. Because the argument was, sign 
you don't pay anything, and you can have a house. It, it's difficult to resist that, you know, and very persuasive. And, and again, the images, battalions, we're talking 16 million signatures in a few years. That's battalions of people going out, sign, sign, sign. You know, there's a large number of people who you can't, that's a lot of signatures. And I also don't understand why why there wasn't more of an uprising. And I mean, these were people who already were not so advantaged, and they got like a double hit after that. I mean, it really is a tragic story. And the, as I mentioned, the instrument then begins to enter into Europe as well. It's a brilliant instrument. You know, this happens. Um, I'm now doing a lot of stuff on this algorithmic mathematical stuff, you know, and it's brilliant stuff, but it's it can also be deployed in very destructive ways, you know, which is sort of always, um, we have a bit of a fantasy. If it's brilliant intelligence, it's got to be more or less, you know, good, but no, it isn't, <laughs> not necessarily. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think I want to ask about the status of the urban in the talk um, and the emphasis very on the good. urban. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think partly I'm thinking about, I don't know if you know this book by this young geographer, Phil Neal, called Hinterland. God, this is like, there's so much feedback on this. Yeah. It's really quite distracting. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, he makes the argument basically that geography historically, particularly contemporary geography, focuses too much on the urban. And that in fact, if we want to understand the kind of spatial landscape of the present, that we would be better served by tuning ourselves to what he terms hinterlands, which are something like what we would call suburbia, um, and that there, those are the spaces where the that's where manufacturing is happening. It's logistics hubs. It's um, where extractive industries often are based, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And he points out that um, twice as much, twice <coughs> as many people in the developed world live in suburbs as live in either cities or rural areas, and also that more immigrants live in suburbs than in cities, and also that more poor people live in suburbs than in cities, and also that so much political foment over the last number of years has happened in suburbs, whether it's the Banlieu or Ferguson, right? Um, and so I guess I'm just curious about, I don't know, what you make of that and whether no, or not, why yeah. it's still important to talk about cities. Well, my God. Well, yeah. So, yes, of course I'm aware of that. But, you know, I, I don't focus on that. I think there is, um, I mean, I've done a few interventions on that whole subject, but uh, um, that is all happening. And a lot of that is good. You know, I am one of those who has argued that that these small towns that are losing people, people should be going to them rather than coming to New York, because New York is just right now almost unmanageable, right? So I'm all for that. What I am focusing on is how the economic system at the highest levels, the most uh, complex uh, instruments, how that has functioned. In a way, that is what I was focusing on mostly. Uh, but yes, there is... I mean, but part of his point is that people, it's not the case that people are not there. It's not the case that they're that they're either, like, I mean, they're a lot densely populated, obviously, but, yeah. but that a massive portion of the world's population does live in those places, and that most economic out activity outside of the financial sector happens there. Yeah, but, but see, I'm trying to get at something different. It's not... Where are people and how are they living? I'm trying to get at how people are used, cities are used, etc., by some very powerful actors. That's an invisible story. We have a lot of great books, great data on all the, especially the smaller cities and how they're thriving and the good things, and in some of the big cities, the good things. I was not talking about the city as such, I was talking about a particular function. Eh? that is emerging in cities and that is very, a very negative factor. That, th that is what I was talking about. So I was not describing cities. Like, like derivatives in the, the location. Yeah, the, the, right. In between, of course, I said the city, the city. But, but I just want to emphasize that, that my main concern was to make visible a dynamic that is quite invisible. And I could say much more about that too, but you know. Uh, so th that is what I was trying, how the cities were used. 
how, and at the same time, I did en passant, of course, mention that the city is also a place where those without power, you know, can stand, get to make a history. But I was talking extremes. I was not focusing on, you know, all the nice things that are also happening. Yeah, I didn't mean nice things per se either. But well, no. well, but, but whatever, you know. But, I just but meant you... that like everything that those derivatives are derived from is happening and being produced and being sold and being exchanged outside of cities. So that they have a significant, like, that they have a significant cultural role in the development of something like a financial market. But the entire realm of materiality on which those instruments are based exists largely outside of them. Well, I, you know, I, we, we have a disagreement. Let's, let me put it that way. I think the instruments that I'm talking about are a certain type of instrument. Sure, there are firms who are located outside too. Sure, there are, for whatever reason, in, in suburbs, etc. But I'm, I'm talking about a rather rarefied set of actors, and it's a partial part of any of those financial firms that are involved, and how that can affect negatively in the city. I was not describing the city. I, it was another trajectory, so I'm really sorry if I wasn't John, clear. John, but I can mediate a little bit, because <laughs> I think what Saskia is talking about is Silicon Valley. The, the, there's a formation of certain systemic nature. So you would not see the... Silicon Valley is a suburb. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a, no, it's a suburb, but it's a location. So, yeah. and, and, and the things coming out of there start governing all the spaces outside. So I think, in the, and, and you're yeah. absolutely right, things are happening outside. Yeah, I, I, yes, absolutely. these developments are located initially because the, whether it's the synergy of Silicon Valley, it's pretty densely populated now. So it's almost urban, San, San Francisco and around. But what's interesting is that you're right, absolutely right, about it's kind of you know vast scope. Uh, yeah. But but the developments are very located. I think that. Right? In fact, I'm one of those who has pushed very hard uh, uh, within New York to tell certain firms move to Akron, Ohio, because there they know how to do some things with glass, etc. You know, and and a, a lot of things like that. But that was not the subject that I was talking about here. What I was talking about here was really something else. Uh, that first there, I think. Um, you talk about the... Oh, thanks. Do, do you, can you hear me? <laughs> you <can> know, <laughs> um, you're talking about... Uh, you mentioned how the subprime mortgage crisis began with a lot of people being... that essentially wouldn't have acquired property under the previous regime of, of uh, thinking about how to give people mortgages. Right, and it, was a new, they were, it was an innovation. Right, they were given, they so, sign this, and and so so the story could be understood as you they had a house and then they didn't. But it seems like there is a net loss. Is that what you're talking about? And is that net loss concentrated in the same way that the loss of what they gained through those... Uh, um, what the what the actual the, the grabbers so right. to say got they they didn't go back to where they were before the mortgage they went below and that, is that, that is that more intensely true for a certain subject subset of the population yeah mm -hmm. the, uh, yes the other thing that I did not mention because I don't want to complicate it too much is that within the ten years it's at most ten years of this history of inventing this instrument forcing people to sign you know and say you can own it. Uh, a whole bunch of high income, high level, whatever, and firms made a lot of money. Those who went bankrupt of the biggies, I don't talking about the modest people, were those who hang on to the instruments too long. But you can see, because there is this, what, what they never show is a parallel history of profit making that happens. <laughs> but I also want to, to put on the table, just because this may enable understanding, and that is that student debt huh, in the United States, it's over a trillion. So guess what? The financial firms bought it. They're not stupid. They know what they're doing. It's a negative. See, with algorithmic mathematics, you enter a completely different concept of what can deliver the goods, and the time frame is often very important in there. So what you have is financial firms buying up. I mean, we're talking a vast number of these mortgages, of these student debt elements, because they can work with it. You know, it, it's just algorithmic mathematics, and again, it's physicists. You know, when you walk into Goldman Sachs, you don't have secretaries anymore. You have 
a hundred physicists, and one of them is my buddy, he's a professor at Columbia University, <laughs> and so he also feeds me a lot of this info. But, but, uh, and, so, and, and, and that capability, that very particular, highly admirable capability, and the physicists are brilliant, you know, and they're doing their stuff and inventing and innovating, they're not thinking about, you know, the negatives that are happening. And, but once you do that, you really, reposition the X, whatever the X might be, in a totally different operational field. You know, and that is difficult to understand in a way. But but this is and and that multiplication of values where I started with, you know, these extraordinary valuations, mm -hmm. that's also partly enabled by that. And the student debt, it's a debt. And it's a debt that the students will never pay. But under these conditions, the financial system can work with that. And that's different from traditional banking. You know, traditional banking couldn't do that. And so these are mechanisms that are, they border on evil, you know, on some level in the sense that what is this? How is this possible? You know, it's, it's really, and, and there are quite a few of those. And, and sort of, it's sort of disturbing to see it and disturbing to understand that it's not being seen. It's an invisible story. Huh? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I want to, um, I have some historical questions, ah. and I'm going back to your slide of the different properties in London, oh, and right. how you were talking about how the capitalist relations are occluded, you can't see them, you walk around and you're sort of mystified by, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a, a nostalgia for real Britain, but it's, it's foreign owned and multiply mortgaged and all the things you spoke of, but I wonder the extent to which that's always been true, that capital yeah. always seeks to occlude itself in the, the built environment. Because I, I, I heard, I think, a tincture of nostalgia for like, well, you used to be able to see this stuff, like the boss owned the big house and you had the yeah. little one, but I don't think it was ever quite that lucid. But it is now, sure, of course, you're right. But today it has exploded. You know, today it's more diversities involved than, and I'm talking the, the period with which I'm comparing, you know, it's not necessarily the 1800s. Huh? I'm, I'm thinking about really the post-World War II period, which marks a particular phase in our Western style economies, you know, different countries, different, but it's a very specific modality after World War II, et cetera. So, it's absolutely the case that certainly in, in cities like Amsterdam and, and London, there was a lot of all kinds of stuff happening along those lines. But th there is also a specificity to what I was describing. It belongs in terms of the instrumentalities, the instruments that are developed. It is of our epoch rather than of that older epoch. But cities, I mean, cities have always been open systems where, you know, all kinds of actors could come in. Small towns may be more difficult, I don't know, but that there are so many, it's difficult to track that. But cities are that way. They are complex, open systems. And as I said, for me, they contain inside of them the frontier concept. And certainly today, that is the only frontier, I think, more or less. But, uh, but historically, there was a frontier element always because there were these actors from different worlds who had an encounter, who could have an encounter. And yeah, anyhow, I don't know if I'm addressing what you were asking, but so it, I, I do think it is a bit different now, just to come back to your question. Maybe I just want to know, I want you to periodize when it becomes different from then. Like when are we 1980s, talking? In, the 1980s. So, so with, the, with the subprime crisis or after that? No, the subprime, see the subprime crisis was only a crisis for certain actors. But the subprime crisis already represented that. But it is in the, for me, this, you know, the timing thing is always a subject of debate. For sure. me, this begins, as I said, uh, in, the 1980, in, 19, in the 1980s, when we globalized and we digitized. And that creates a whole new operational field. And we, glo you know, it, it means all kinds of things. So, so that is when it begins. But then it begins, in a way that we cannot see, you know, it's not, that is why at the beginning I was emphasizing what we don't see. Huh? And, and it explodes on the scene quite recently, actually. One, one might say the, the big crisis is a moment when people begin to say, hey, what the hell is happening here? 
uh, and and that sub mortgage crisis, you know, that was you know, 15 million households, 14.5 million households that sort of lose everything. Then it, sort of other actors begin to see well, something changed here. Uh, so these are short histories, but in some ways I would say. Wow, it took a long time. And this new stuff where I, by the way, I recommend a film that is called At Push Tire, huh? the film, which is the housing representative for the United Nations with a great filmmaker who have gone across 15 countries tracking one financial firm whose name shall remain unmentioned. Uh, but I know what it, which one it is. Uh, that has been buying up low-income big housing complexes in about 15 countries. And the question is, what are they doing? And so the film is absolutely, the film has been a little revolution. It just came out like two weeks ago, and it's being shown everywhere. And the rapporteur, Leila Farani, uh, she's, a, she's, she's from... Um, she, she's in Toronto, but she, I, I don't know, but she has, she's short <laughs> and courageous, and she is, she, it's just been a, like a little revolution, you know, in a particular world. So I recommend that film, and it's called At Push the Film. You will learn a lot that you thought couldn't happen, you know, that kind of stuff. So the story that I began to describe here is a story that continues, and it's marked by extraordinary innovations. You know, you have to stand back and say, wow, but, you know, some of them really are destructive. Yeah, there were some other questions. level actors and instruments that you're examining that operate in these urban environments and you know are kind of metastasizing everywhere these high level actors and instruments are fundamentally changing the nature of the city that you describe as this place of encounter that draws many different people that is an open space where everyone comes in and that um, that the city actually needs lots of different kinds of people with a range of skills and a range of income levels and I think if we look at like San Francisco or Manhattan, as you mentioned, um, these high level finance actors are changing the way of the city so that low income people cannot, can no longer live in yeah. the city. They yeah. come in yeah. and do all the service yeah. work and yeah. then they have to commute four yeah. hours yeah. to get back home. Yeah. And this goes back to the hinterland thing, right? Yeah. So like the, these suburbs well. are becoming like, like pockets of poverty. And also the thing is, is like as uh, people who are disempowered get pushed out of the city to actually, as their space of where they, they are a citizen and where yeah. they live, they also are, they're getting pushed out of that, the, the city as a space where they have a voice. And so I was wondering if you could talk about, like, yeah. I understand that you're, you're, you're focused on the high level finance people, but I want to I, I yeah. think about like how these two things are, right. are related to each other. Yeah. And then the other thing is like, um, one of your arguments is that we have this new systematics and a logic of extraction that is fundamentally new. So I was wondering if you could just- Fundamentally what new, what is fundamentally new? Uh, uh, the logic of ext extraction. All extractive logics, right. So I wanted to know what exactly is new? Right, right. Because it seems like the techniques that are facilitated by digitization and globalization, all this like high tech stuff, right. um, those might be new, but the logic of extraction seems super old to me. Okay, but you know, of course you can say that. Mm -hmm. But what are you going to understand about how they are functioning? You've got to understand that some of the innovations they are making in terms of how they produce the, the instruments that will allow them to extract, that those have changed, and we need to know that. I See, people are often saying, why bother, you know? No, we have to learn. Some of us, I'm not a physicist, but luckily I have a buddy huh, who helps me understand. And, 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 and the fact that you enter Goldman Sachs and you where there were 100 secretaries, now there are 100 physicists. That matters. We need to know that. And it, I don't hold it against a physicist. But these are, these are powerful new tools that are getting developed that override 
all kinds of older tools. This notion that it's the same old story, not that you said that, huh? but that no, there are foundational transformations in the capabilities that are being put in play. And that is one part of what I was trying to say. So, you know, a lot of what you said, and they are in other locations, yes, of course, but I was trying to get at some sort of core element in our economies today that core elements that are not easy to track or to follow, but that have very powerful impacts. What is happening in high finance today has almost nothing to do with what was happening in finance 20 years ago or 30 years ago. There is a change. The fact that finance buys a huge student debt should put us all on alarm rather than saying, oh, well, of course they would do that. No, why would they buy student debt? Why are they buying all kinds of things that they're buying? I mean, it's a horror what's happening. So I just want, I didn't want to be that dramatic when I was giving my talk, clearly. But anyhow, but there is a change. I'm not saying that everything changed, but there is a change. And I want to track that change. And I'm not the only one who's doing that. You know, we must understand this. This is my position. You know, of course, people can disagree and say it's always the same old story. The rich get richer. And yeah, you can say that. But these are other, these are capabilities that I think we should understand. Yeah. And if I understand yeah, yeah. correctly, yeah. I think what you're trying, I think the logic, the, I think the newest, the reversal is in logic. So while uh, the housing asset, and I think this is, goes back to your predatory part, <coughs> the housing asset used to back up the finance. Now, that relationship has reversed in the sense that finance has no foundations. It appears that they still are talking about the actual houses. That <laughs> reversal is the kind of Heideggerian you know, notion of the technology where, where finance frames the real in a way and the real report back to the finance. <laughs> and that, I think that is something new with, with the kind of what we call the, you know, the algorithmic logic. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know if we have time. But I think no, no, but that's, I, that's I, very good, very well put, yes. So let's just grab some of these questions. What I have a question was referring to uh, is that this position has been uh, around for a long, long time. And technologies of disposition have, have changed. Right. Um, and that point is very well taken. Now, yeah. what one other thing I found interesting in your, uh, in your talk was you mentioned in passing about the Qatari royal family. Now, have you, I know you are, um, you are focusing on uh, financial institutions, but have you looked at the shenanigans of governments yes. in, 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 say, Africa, I mean, China? I've, I've done a lot of research on that. I have a book which has a lot of information on that. Right, right, right. right. So, so I have, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. Say, yeah, but is this, yeah, so am I answering your question now? Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I have, I have my latest, my, my, uh, my latest book, not my last book, my latest book, uh, that is called Expulsions, Brutality and Complexity in the Global Economy. I have several chapters there that deal with, um, with the question of land. I'm totally gone into land now, I must say. And uh, I also have an article that I'm very happy to give you where I make an argument about migration. And I argue that, look, if, we're, if it is poverty and the desire of a better life that explains migration, then we should have two billion. We don't. So what is it? that pushes migrants. And it's a larger world. And one image I like to use, you know, when I give this kind of talk is I say, the decision to migrate, to the decision, no, the fact that will enable migrations of this sort happens in the boardrooms mm -hmm. right there, you know, in whatever, in whatever the countries. That's an extra, that is an exaggerated image, but that is what I'm trying to say. So I argue that if it were really the immigrant decides to have a better life, it's just not enough of an explanation. So I've done research in Honduras at the risk of my life, and in Salvador, and in Myanmar. And a year ago, I was arguing in Myanmar, and nobody accepted it. I was saying, this is not about religion. Religion is the easy explanation. This is something else. When those 52 villages were burned, you know, and they threw out all those people, they, you know, 
Well, very soon after that, the military were there. And I had my explanation. The Chinese are building a huge port mm -hmm. in that very poor area that everybody thought that that doesn't matter. It was not religion. It was religion for some few that were deployed or kill them, you know. But the military had a project and the military owned land. The land is the domain of the military. In. And they have a line and they say, burnt land. If it was all those houses, burnt land is the land of the military. I mean, when you look at these history, and so I have, this has been my battle. You have known me for a long time, right? I, I don't disagree with people, but I see what they don't see. And I think it's because I grew up in seven languages. I don't speak a single language well. I have a foreign accent in all of the languages that I speak. And so everything is a mess. And in that mess, oh, but there's also that. You know, that is sort of my explanation. My first book, which now is considered a classic, rejected by 12 publishers. 12. Mm -hmm. No, brilliant stuff, but where does it fit? So I have been there in the barricades, I cannot tell you. And, but you know, I'm Dutch and we Dutch, we sort of, you know, we take it sort of <laughs> smiling a bit, you know, we're not dramatic people, sort of. So, but, but no, I, I, I appreciate your, your asking me that question. So, one, one last point now. <laughs> Uh, yes. You spoke about financial institutions. Uh, would you care to uh, comment about how they are eviscerating virtually all the institutions that we have uh, built over over generations? I mean, the judiciary, for example, yeah. in a country like India, the state, of course, yeah. and so they're all being overrun by these uh, entities yeah. in the in the quest for land. And because it, it's like a, that's an that's an easy take. You know, I mean, the student debt is that simple example too. Oh, student debt, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll take the trillion. We'll take the debt. I think we have uh, yeah. the last two questions. One here and one there. So first what I was going to ask, because you were focusing on land, how yeah. do you see the connection between land and student debt? Because my, my, my underpinning understanding was that one of the real issues with student debt, debt was because it was being monetized by turning it into other sorts of financial instruments. And then, of course, doing harm to the students who would eventually not be able to pay and have, have all sorts right. of difficulties right. that are fall on to that. Yeah. But since you're focusing on land and you bring up student debt, I don't see the connection specifically between No, no, they're not, they're not connected. I'm sorry. The, the student debt is its own animal. Which has to do with the monetization of that debt and then turning it into other financial yeah. instruments, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and, and also because with algorithmic mathematics, you can actually transform a negative into a working thing. Clearly, and that's exactly right. what happened with the housing problem. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And but that is, not the, the, but the connection with whatever that no, no. But it was just that what you just said. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> One last. Right, so uh, I think I have a good, good last question for you. Um, uh -huh. so, Aha. So uh, I was wondering if you could kind of put your analysis of the new extractive logic of this new extractive logic in relation to historical capitalism <laughs> as a system. And I'm thinking specifically, you know, of Arigi's analysis of systemic cycles of accumulation, where you have like a productive expansion of the world economy followed by a financial expansion, right. which starts another right. productive expansion. So if, right. that, if that holds, right. Right, we should be witnessing a productive expansion. <laughs> but what your work shows is that these predatory uh, expulsions are not akin to the steam engine. They're not organizing a productive expansion of, of the world economy. Yeah. Right? And you mentioned that there's no more frontiers. Which leads me to wonder, right, whether the new... The historic frontier, right? the historic frontier, which is out there at the right. edges of empire, yeah. et cetera, right. right? Which leads me to wonder whether the new systemic logic that you're tracking, if it's something beyond capitalism, or at least beyond the capitalism a, we've mm -hmm. known since the long, t long 16th century. So put differently, I'm just wondering, are we witnessing the birth of a post-capitalist system that's worse than capitalism, right? A scenario that like Wallerstein and other people have been warning about for a while. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I would have a hard time putting it literally the way you put it, you know, because it would be jumping through so many hoops. But on some level, you can say that. I do think that the language of capitalism 
is no longer helpful in this sense. It's a very powerful image. It's shorthand. There are situations where you want to use it because that's what is understood. But when I'm doing my research, when I'm trying to understand what the hell is happening, capitalism is just not a term. I like the term, mind you, but it doesn't help me get at something, you know, that, so, so that, but what you raise, you know, is sort of interesting that I rarely have heard somebody put it like that, you know, that, that something is changing, right? And, and how do we name it? And that is why I begin to use this language of extractive logics, which is a lower level instrument than talking about a system. The presence of extractive logics is a partial event, right? But it navigates, clearly its navigational space is also expanding, right? So it's a way of tracking. I like, I like, like a dog, you know, on the ground. That's what I did in Myanmar too, right? What is actually happening here? So I found out about the port that the Chinese are building there. So suddenly it becomes bad. You know, but the people who were just looking at its it's religion. They couldn't see that. So that is something that, that, that does that I do, and that means that I use a certain kind of language, etc. Even though that language might also be partial. Huh? Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I think with that. Just yeah. Thank you. Okay. So let's, these comments.